In this video I draw some lines between Friedrich Nietzsche and Louis Armstrong and try to get past dualistic thinking and the fight for individual liberty. It's a weird one, but maybe you'll get something out of it. I mean, you probably will, because I'm awesome. <laughs> pretty young in my grandma's kitchen. It was a bright Sunday afternoon and I was thinking about what I had heard that morning. I asked her, okay grandma, so everybody's the same. She said, yeah, that's right. I said, and everybody's different? Yeah, that's true too. I remember feeling like a window was opening on some profound and archaic wisdom, something only the initiated have access to. Because let's be honest, that's how rhetoric works on the social level, right? Everyone is the same, therefore Y. Or everyone is different, ergo X. But no, even then, I started to see how conflicting ideas can both be true. Reality is complex enough that dualisms, that kind of black and white thinking, just start to fall apart. If people insist on holding on to them too tightly, they actually prevent them from seeing things the way they really are, so they end up being deceptive. This kind of thing is what we mean when we talk about non-dual spirituality. We want to get beyond all these unhelpful and sometimes violent dualistic categories. And that's why I want to talk about identity politics. The politics of identity is a way of thinking heavily influenced by Foucault and Derrida and Nietzsche, all philosophers whom I love. Derrida explored how meaning and identity are not singular and stable. They are constantly proliferating more and more different meanings and identities. Foucault explored how power is knowledge. Naming things is violent. Grouping things together erases the differences between them, gives us the illusion of knowledge when really we're just imposing our own assumptions onto the world, and we're not really seeing the world for how it actually is. And so these ideas contributed to a way of thinking about freedom and unity in terms of individual identity. Social structures must be changed to accommodate endlessly proliferating differences in our identity, otherwise we do violence to people. And there's a lot of good in that. Instead of seeking one normative identity to which everyone has to subscribe in order to belong, they offer us endlessly proliferating identities which must be accepted and, if necessary, protected. In some ways, this politics of identity has won more freedom and happiness for many people. It's necessary insofar as injustice is predicated upon identity. There are problems with this line of thinking, though. It tends to make any kind of group identity vulnerable to accusations of oppression. Because communities have boundaries, no matter how generous those boundaries may be. And creating an in-group necessarily creates an out-group. And because we desire, and even need, a sense of belonging and community, I can't believe that drawing boundaries around a community is in itself a bad thing. It can't be the case that celebrating what we have in common is always violent. I think we know that intuitively, we're just afraid that it can be taken too far. True unity doesn't mean we have to be the same. But also, there's no unity in endlessly proliferating difference. If you can't deal with the complexity of all of those things being true at the same time, you can't deal with the complexity of reality. Proliferation of difference is good. And recognition of what makes us fundamentally human is also good. Beneath all of those differences which we celebrate, there is a profound base of shared humanity. And I argue that shared humanity is the only place where we will find true unity. What we all have in common is more important than what separates us and makes us unique. We should be free to be as unique and individual as we need to be, precisely because individual identity is not what freedom and unity are based on. If no degree of difference changes our fundamental humanity, 
then no degree of difference can artificially restrict our unity and our freedom. Because our value lies not in our egos, but in our shared humanity. So when I say shared humanity, what do I mean? What is it that we all have in common? The best summary of that I've ever found is in the Louis Armstrong song. A man wants to work for his pay. He wants a place in the sun. He wants a gal proud to say she'll become his loving wife. He wants the chance to give his kids a better life. Now, that's an old song, and it's written from a particular perspective. But the point is this. We all want to contribute meaningfully. We all want our needs met, including security and pleasure. We all want companionship and community. We all want to care for others to generally make life better. Now, people who are not in touch with their hearts will not show or maybe even be aware of these desires. Conflict and trauma can wall us off to them or even invert them. Various disabilities can affect how they are expressed. But at root, these are the desires central to the human experience. In the New Testament, Paul adds one more thing to the list. Suffering. Suffering is central to the human experience, and so uniting in our weakness and our pain has a special power and value. Trying to build inclusiveness out of strong and defensive identities can't even approach that kind of power. Because strong and defensive identities are still all about power and control. But the kind of unity we find in suffering gives up power and control and allows us to find true freedom. So the way to move forward is to move past the old dualism of self versus community to a place where self and community bolster each other. What do you think? What is it that binds us together on that basic level of shared humanity? And how do we honor that? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Subscribe for more videos about healthy spirituality for smart people. Thanks for watching.